pressing in, in uh, the same team as uh, Yuka started with, uh, content repositories, whether they're hierarchical or not. Uh, we as a company, uh, and I'm, uh, by the way, I'm uh, Stephen Nulls from uh, the company Arthurtot, uh, we have been working uh, around content management systems and uh, content repositories for uh, quite a long time now. And um, what I'm basically going to present you is a story we've been uh, living for uh, the past year, uh, year and a half. Uh, it's about uh, the uh, progression we're making uh, from our existing open source content management system, which is DAISY, which is a Java-based uh, CMS uh, specialized in technical documentation, project documentation, uh, quality documentation and all that, uh, which uh, we are now uh, evolving towards a uh, next uh, product, which will be Lily. And uh, Lily, uh, basically what we're going to do now is, is, is give you uh, two, two sides of the story. Uh, first of all, everything we learned, not everything, but uh, at least uh, as much as possible, we learned uh, from uh, going to that next generation version of our product, uh, which is based on, uh, well, NoSQL technology. Otherwise, obviously, we uh, wouldn't be here. Um, I think there's a, a, a lesson we learned, and uh, it's a lesson we learned which is uh, applicable to a lot of software development. Uh, Lily ha uh, Daisy has been six years in the making, six years in doing projects with Lily, uh, with Daisy. I'm going to continuously confuse uh, both with each other. So the old one is Daisy, the new one is Lily. Um, and uh, the lesson that we learned there is that there is a, a correlation uh, between uh, the release numbers of software and uh, the complexity of the architecture and uh, how strange the features uh, tend uh, to be implemented. Eh? Um, and uh, well, the correlation is of the um, is, is of a non-linear linear kind, which means that at uh, some point in your uh, product life cycle, uh, you'll get to that release number, and in our case, it was 3.0, where the complexity goes through the roofs. And if you're going to relate that to uh, user interest, you have to be very careful that uh, you're not uh, going down at uh, that moment. Now, uh, complexity is one thing, and since this is not like an enterprise uh, conference, but rather a uh, let's getting things done uh, conference, uh, I don't think that we're, we're very much uh, interested in complexity as, as a feature, being a bad or a, a good one. Uh, I'll leave that uh, in the middle. Uh, what we prefer is uh, sophistication. So we like a lot of features as a content repository and content management systems vendor, uh, even if it's open source. Uh, for us, uh, we think we having nice features, having good features, having a lot of features is important. Um, so there is some value, so some value behind that. Uh, but uh, the challenging environment that we were heading towards is that, well, we had happy users, we had happy customers, uh, and they were storing a lot of content in our little daisy system. Uh, and uh, I think we hit the same point as uh, Juka uh, just was explaining. At some point in time, you're going to put too much uh, data in your uh, content repository uh, and you want to scale your system and you find out that uh, the architecture of your system isn't quite fit for handling uh, big volumes of data or big volumes of uh of, of users. And uh, there's uh, a reason for that. I think uh, our current product, uh, DAISY, uh, together with all our friends, uh, Alfresco, Drupal, and, and all those, uh, are exposing the same kind of s typical CMS architecture. Um, so uh, we start this architecture exercise with, uh, well, content management, so we need to store content. Uh, so we'll need a database for that. And, uh, well, optionally a file system, and then if we want to search on it, we're going also to put uh, information in a some kind of uh, full text indexing system. And on top of that, whether that's in Java, PHP, Rails, whatever, uh, we're going to build a, uh, a, a application. Uh, but immediately alongside that application, we're going uh, to add a cache. Yeah, because going to hit, uh, we're going to hit that relational database, and that must be avoided as at all costs. So, for some funny reason or another, when building CMSs on top of relational databases, every product out there tries to bypass uh, or at least shield the database away from the application by use of a cache. Okay. 
Uh, so that's the base architecture. And then suddenly your product becomes popular and or actually uh, gets put to use. Uh, and then you get either read or write problems. You get lots of readers or lots of people going to write to that repository. But no problem, we can add more cache. Huh? Uh, and whether that's cache on an application level or whether that's cache on an HTTP level, uh, that doesn't matter mu much. Uh, it means that, uh, well, some way or another, more people will be involved uh, with your application running well. Uh, and not, not always the right people will be involved uh, with your application running well. Uh, I have some friends who work at a hosting company, so they uh, well provide Rails hosting and Drupal hosting and all that. And I think the main added value that they do uh, to their customers is their customers are not technical, they're not developers. They can add indexes to, C to MySQL tables. That's their main added value. They know how to uh, add an index and they know how to tweak cache sizes. The problem is that for uh, for them it's a lost battle a lost battle right from the start huh? so they, they they can add any kind of cache any kind of indexes uh if they're not involved in building the application uh, right from the start uh for them it's uh, it's a lost battle uh, they know they they have to be involved in the architecture of the product uh, uh right from the start no problem we can add even more cache if you want huh? memcache huh? one of the originators of so if we have memcache and we were able to store that on disk now wouldn't that be like a database and well that's basically how well part of the nosql story uh, happened as well huh? uh, and then uh, at the end we can add clients to our architecture uh, and obviously you knew in that client because that client will connect to your system across the network and network calls are bad as well. We can add some cache, we can add RAM everywhere and we'll have a very big uh, uh, enterprise uh, capable content management repository at the cost of a uh, high cost of uh, administration uh, of infrastructure and so on. Now, uh, looking back at sophistication and features, what we found hard to scale in our system, in our DAISY system, uh, are S things we, we, we didn't do uh, on the database level, things we did on an application level and where we required uh, access, random access to, uh, well, the active data, specific uh, system properties of documents, uh, which were we supposed to be in, in memory data cache uh, in order not to hit the relational database too much. Uh, the boring or at least the frustrating thing was uh, that the stuff we hit uh, scalability limits was with uh, was uh, the, the, the features that sold the product. Huh? So everybody started using those features and we knew in advance if you put more than 150,000 documents in DAISY, you'll hit that roof uh, somewhere uh, at that time, which is frustrating uh, in, a, in a product proposition, of course. Next to that, uh, we had, uh, apart from the scaling problem, which is annoying, but, well, if you can predict it, it's not so annoying anymore. Uh, we also had the problem of durability and consistency, and that's also because we exposed or the same kind of architecture that a lot of our competi competitors had as well is we had a relational database, we had Lucene, and we had a file system uh, to store the actual content, the blobs, the binary content uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the stuff that was stored in the CMS. Which meant uh, if you did searches, you would do searches uh, both on MySQL and searches, Lucene searches. Uh, which we had to merge, uh, so we had two result sets, mm, memory objects, we had to merge those, uh, uh, which took time, uh, and we had a problem of some of these merges uh, arriving at document sets which were simply too large to fit in uh, RAM memory of uh, that uh, application, so we had out of memory exceptions at uh, well that 150k of documents. Um, what we also had was the, the fact that we had, uh, upon write time, we had to write stuff in MySQL. We also had uh, to, uh, to write stuff to the file system. So we had the transaction model was, uh, well, non-existent uh, to uh, very, very bad. Needless to say, if you're going to, to do this in an enterprise content, people expect uh, this to be a very uh, robust as well. So they required us failover. Then we said, well, now honestly, looking at MySQL, we know how MySQL saves its data. We know how our file system saves its data. So we can mathematically or scientifically predict that, no, we can't really support this 
even with two nodes, in a, in, a, in a robust way, because there will be a time where there will be data on the relational database, but not yet persisted to the file system, because it's uh, hanging around somewhere in file system caches. Well, we didn't like that. And uh, we also felt uh, that uh, if we added more nodes to our setup, we might be uh, solving the problem of scalability, uh, not of volume, but of usage, because we had a proxy in front of that. Uh, but we were not really using uh, the benefits of true distribution, uh, and that meant uh, being able to scale to more users, to be more available, uh, and to provide a higher performance experience uh, to our users. All of that was not possible because we had this very awkward, yet very common uh, architecture of a content management system. So what we wanted was uh, true distribution, but also uh, in the line of fire. Uh, and one of the solutions we had there was to do more inside the database the relational database. Huh? Uh, that's the, the, the one you learn at school. Uh, now, obviously, there were some trends we were looking into at that time, and I'm talking about one and a half, two years ago, and we knew that in, in advance, uh, obviously, as well. There were some trends happening. Uh, here you see uh, the, trend, the Google trend chart on stored procedures. So there's less and less going on inside the database in terms of application uh, behavior. Uh, to give a more concrete example, uh, uh, there was uh, PLSQL. I don't know how many people still want to hear that word. Uh, um, uh, had ex as exposing uh, the same kind of problem. Uh, but if we ignore these trends, uh, we could add uh, more databases. Uh, master-slave setups, multiple master setups, uh, go uh, bring our reads to the slaves, uh, commit our writes to the, to the masters, the stuff everybody who has been playing around seriously with MySQL has been uh, confronted with. You can add even more databases and to make the problem even worse, uh, you could add message, message buses to that. So you can go in to serialize all the stuff, pass it across the network wire, make that a very strong protocol with strong acknowledge and, and all that, uh, adding more mess to an already uh, convoluted architecture to the end, and I'm just copying this from the Oracle website, uh, <laughs> uh, that you had something like JMS over GDBC. I can't even ex imagine how, how, how that would look like, but uh, they, they put it in there, stuff architectural stuff uh, which would solve our problem. Well, then we happily uh, stumbled upon uh, a presentation uh, on, on cost estimates of, of typical Oracle deployments. Uh, um, well, there were options there. Options, more hardware, more software, less support, more support. What we were looking at was the range. 500K dollars per year for a moderate setup well, you can employ a, ho a whole lot of, 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 of developers for, for, for that amount of money per year. Eh? So we said, well, one of the first lessons we learned in business development was there is user interest, there is a correlation between user interest and price of a solution, but, well, it basically it goes like this. Yeah? So if it gets really, really expensive, there's a good chance that uh, the interest of people is uh, slowly uh, getting smaller as well. So we ended up with the second solution. That's the reason why we're here, obviously. Uh, we figured uh, MySQL is not going to do it for us. We wanted to scale big uh, and to be highly available uh, with our content repository. So uh, we went uh, the NoSQL route. Now, uh, this is a very exciting time uh, for people who are building NoSQL systems. Uh, it's a, a bit of a, a confusing time for people who want to use them. Eh? Because first of all, everything you heard over today and tomorrow, you have to put it into doubt. We've been studying hard on all these content stores, uh, on all of them uh, on uh, this uh, Cambrian explosion slide. Eh? And we found out that we must read all the marketing on the website with extreme care and with an active uh, disbelief uh, of what they are saying. So if somebody says this is a distributed database, they actually mean a distributable s a database. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen a slide, uh, I'm not going to mention the product there, where they say they scale to the complexity of data. Not to the volume of data, but to the com that's nice in some way. But if you're looking to a scalable system and to put a lot of information in it, then you want one which scales to the volume of data and not to the complexity. But complex, complex data is something totally different. So uh, we had some uh, requirements. 
uh, in looking at it. We haven't been looking at all of them in depth, but quite a few of them. Uh, we spent uh, at least a couple of weeks to a month uh, uh, playing around with them. Um, the first requirement was we wanted automatic scaling. Uh, we're building a product that will be used by others, which means we can't influence the partitioning schema a lot. We don't have a lot of domain knowledge on what could drive a partitioning scheme. So we wanted something which, which supported auto partitioning for any kind of generic set of any kind of generic content, eh? uh, whether that be website content or a, 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 an image archive uh, or a patent database or well that kind of stuff, eh? not knowing in before what the domain logic which, would which could possibly drive uh, the, um, the uh, partitioning. We wanted stuff to be fault tolerant, eh? uh, so we wanted to have automatic replication, uh, keeping uh, at least two, three, four, five copies of uh, anything we save into uh, the database. Uh, we wanted a, a model with sparse data. The reason for that is that a lot of content management uh, problems we are confronted with require sparse data. You have tags, you have keywords, all that kind of stuff. And I don't know what is happening, it's, it's annoying. Um, it had to run on, on commodity hardware. Uh, we wanted to have efficient random access to data, so uh, uh, random access or at least being able to scan uh, to, uh, to data. Uh, what we also wanted uh, was it to be an open source and like real open source. And we had some preference being a Java shop for a Java solution. That considerably narrows down the possibilities. Yeah. We first invented the requirements and then we started, uh, it's not, uh <laughs> these were the true requirements. Uh, now, uh, then we started comparing systems and we suddenly realized that uh, the real important choices were that first slide, but uh, those were even more important. Uh, consistency for a content management system or a content repository is very important. If people save their data to our system, they expect the data to be saved. Once you get the call back, uh, you must be sure that it is persisted on disk, that it is replicated and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the eventually consistent systems were a bit of a problem for us then. Uh, we also wanted atomicity in updating a single uh, document or record in our say, uh, case. Uh, and uh, we realized that we were planning to store a lot of data, uh, like tens of millions of documents. Uh, uh, now, if we wanted to re-index that, we wanted to provide, and we're going to provide search on that uh, on top of that as well, we needed access to a uh, MapReduce environment uh, to, to, to do that efficiently. So that brought us, uh, in the end, to HBase, uh, which is an Apache project, which brought us not only the fact that we had some product uh, to base our content repository on, uh, what we had a nice data model, and it's the same kind of data model which, which is all, uh, well, comparable data model, uh, which is available with some other systems as well. Uh, but uh, what we found out is that uh, they had ordered table scans in HBase as well. We could make some clever use of that in building uh, custom indexes on top of uh, HBase. Uh, what it as, uh, that brought uh, as well was access to the entire H stack of products, which means we now have access to Mahout, Pick, Hive, MapReduce, HDFS for storing uh, blobs which don't fit in uh, HBase. So uh, that felt for us uh, a quite nice environment to work with. So now we had a data store. Uh, the problem is that a content repository uh, provides both uh, content storage but also search and uh, it turned out that search was uh, much harder of a problem. Um, we knew that some way or another we're going to use Lucene because well yeah what else is there. Huh? Um, now the problem uh, with Lucene is uh, not the problem with Lucene because there's no problem with Lucene. I think the connectedness of Lucene between the promise and the delivery is great. It acts as uh, uh, is labeled on the box. But uh, in a CMS system, you typically need two types of search. First of all, you, have you need access to some kind of structured search, uh, very comparable with SQL, if I can say, uh, to quickly uh, get some documents uh, in your repository, uh, 
which the result of that will be numbers, strings, uh, which is based on logical operations. Uh, and on the other hand, you had the loose scene search, the information retrieval search, where you had uh, you needed access to uh, an inverted index. Um, and all of that, uh, these two types of search, uh, we needed them at scale. Uh, so that was quite of a demanding uh, environment. Uh, the structured search, we're going to um, solve that uh, by uh, making clever use, or at least we think it's clever, you, you're free to laugh at it, uh, to make uh, use of uh, the scanning capabilities uh, of HBase uh, and uh, some trick we learned from the Google App Engine design uh, where, uh, well, if you can't uh, index, we, we don't have proper indexes in HBase and you don't have proper indexes in, in a lot of NoSQL uh, systems. Uh, While well you can make use of the values, uh, compute, those, uh, compute those into the, the, the values you want an index on, compute those into uh, keys and in an, in an extra table and uh, make use of the ordered scanning uh, in, for instance, HBase, but I, I guess there's others uh, which will support that as well, uh, to uh, quickly access uh, a data entity which sits in uh, the content table. Now, Lucene, um, as good as it is, it offers no built-in support for sharding, no built-in support for replication or for index updates. And the end, well, the index updates uh, are batched. That's my point. So we wanted to have a system where if you put a new document in it, you know that predictably within a short amount of time, the index to full text search on that or uh, search on that uh, would be uh, updated. And there's a bunch of choices there as well, and we've looked at those choices. Uh, we've uh, had a, a brief look at Kata. The problem there was that though even it's a very scalable architecture, it had uh, only support for search and not for indexing, which meant work, work for us. But we tried to optimize the work we wanted to do uh, against the benefit we got from it. Uh, Elasticsearch, uh, after having talked with the author uh, yesterday and today, uh, was and is still a young product. I think it's very uh, promising uh, in, uh, in the next few months. We'll surely have another look at it. Then you had a number of solutions to start the Lucene inverted index uh, into uh, HBase. There's solutions there uh, to do it uh, on top of Cassandra as well. Uh, but we were afraid that uh, looking at the features that we were going to use, uh, those features uh, often require um, uh, stuff being available in cache. I'm not allowed to say that now because I've been laughing at caches uh, all the way along. Um, but for instance, facet uh, browsing and all that requires like hot warmed up caches. And uh, you don't know how to control these if you store these into uh, HBase and I think also in Cassandra. Um, so we ended up basically with the promise that Solar is there, it's available for a long time, um, it has a nice query uh, syntax and there is work going on on a cloud branch. So, well, that was it basically. We had HBase, we had Solar and we had Lily. Well, the problem there was we had to connect those. Eh? So uh, we wanted to connect these two components and all of these components had to work uh, in a distributed fashion. Eh? Uh, which means that we needed a bridge uh, between uh, HBase and Solar uh, for indexing, re-indexing and all that. Uh, and we wanted to have a reliable method uh, of both systems talking to each other. Again, the solution could be easy and say, well, we'll use some Acme message queue thing. Uh, ActiveMQ, RESTMQ, RabbitMQ, and so on MQ. There's lots of MQs out there. Uh, the problem is that they all use MySQL as a persistence layer, or most of them, which is a bit of a problem because, first of all, that adds administrative effort to the people who are managing uh, a Lily uh, installation. And second, we'll end up with the same kind of availability, robustness problem uh, as we had with DAISY. So uh, what we ended up with, and that's the first contribution that we want to make to the uh, HBase, but also the broader uh, NoSQL community, uh, is uh, a write ahead lock and a queue system, very simple, very dedicated to uh, Java developers uh, wanting to bridge uh, between uh, an HBase or and, uh, and some other system to have but two functions. First of all, guaranteed execution uh, of synchronous actions. We use that to update or 
uh, secondary indexes in HBase. Uh, and the other thing is uh, a queue system, a proper queue system, but then again also uh, quite simplified uh, for triggering of asynchronous actions, which we're going to use uh, to update uh, the solar backend. With the idea that ideally in normal operations, the size of the ride ahead lock is. Uh, well, just a number of concurrent uh, connections, and the queue could be larger depending on uh, the speed of uh, the backend process. So uh, that's basically Lily. Uh, we have a model, uh, a, a repository document or record model, which is very simple. Uh, we maintain records and fields, uh, sets of fields in that. Fields can be content, can be metadata, and so on. Uh, we mapped that onto HBase as a storage engine. Uh, we make that indexed and searchable uh, through Solar uh, using uh, a wall and queue mechanism, which we implemented in HBase as well, uh, with client-server communication uh, in uh, Avro. Now, uh, I'm go not going to bore you with architecture slides. Um, I'm going to invite you uh, to uh, start uh, learning uh, what is out there uh, since, uh, well, Sunday, basically. Um, which is uh, a whole lot of documentation on the API we're offering, uh, the, a whole lot of information on the architecture itself, and uh, a more in-depth explanation on the technology choices that we made, with the promise that if you get back to us on mid-July, mid you'll have a proof of architecture release, so uh, code you can download, uh, you can play around with, uh, and see uh, where we're heading up to uh, uh, with the idea to have three monthly releases after that, uh, leading up to Lily 1.0 somewhere uh, in the beginning uh, of uh, next year. Uh, all of that is available from our website, uh, bit.ly uh, Lily pre-release. Uh, I've tweeted it as well, so if you search on the Berlin buzzword hashtag, you'll find it out. Uh, best of all, we don't want to be fussy about licensing, so we're just going to uh, use the Apache license uh, to distribute uh, Lily. Uh, which uh, generates the obvious question, how are you going to uh, make money out of it? Well, we've been doing this for six years with DAISY as well, which is also open source, also Apache. So we're going to provide uh, consulting, mentoring uh, services uh, and deliver turnkey projects together with uh, partners, uh, which could be vertically market-based. If you're working in media, if you're working uh, in uh, pharma and that kind of stuff, um, then we want to help you to become successful uh, with Lily, which could be based on geographical focus. Uh, we're not planning on launching a German office. We'd like to find German partners instead. Um, and the scope of it uh, would be something like media finance, insurance, government, uh, heritage, which have a lot of data uh, and which don't have budgets, uh, which you need for the Oracle solution, uh, but which need uh, a searchable storage and uh, a scalable uh, storage and a search uh, solution, uh, which we hope uh, Lily will become in uh, the next few months. So if you need more information, either talk to me. I'll be here until uh, tomorrow night. I'm really excited about uh, the conference as well. There's a lot of interest apparently and in NoSQL as a topic, uh, but the combination of search especially, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with Lily, is building store and search next to each other. Um, you can find stuff on the website and uh, or uh, follow our Twitter account to learn more about future releases, especially mid-July. If you want to have your hands on the code, then uh, there's be there'll be stuff uh, to play around with. Thanks for your attention. I don't know if uh, we have uh, still time for questions. Any questions, you yes, sir? No. I can repeat the question. Uh, no, 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 there will be just, uh, I have to repeat the question, uh, whether there will be a, a true open development environment for DAISY and an open code repository, yes, there will be, uh, just as with all our other open source products. Uh, the reason we're doing uh, actively partner recruitment is to find uh, right from the start a healthy collaborative coding community uh, around it. So there won't be tar balls being dumped <laughs> um, as, um, well, uh, happens sometimes. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. 
we started talking a bit too soon in that process, but we're planning to go that way uh, soon now. Um, I don't know what part you're specifically interested in, what you'll find out. Um, I didn't really understand uh, what, what you were looking for. Uh, we'll have Zookeeper and we will be using Zookeeper uh, for configuration uh, of the nodes, um, but uh, also for well any kind of distributed service coordination um, we're, we're, we're planning to, and that's one of the reasons we're enthusiastic about Solar Cloud as well, is because they rely on Zookeeper uh, as part of the system as well. I don't know if, if because uh, uh, the write ahead log will be persisted in an HBase table, huh? uh, which obviously is, is managed uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, well in, con in co collaboration wi with Zookeeper. Yeah, we're not going to store operational data, uh, content data, whether that be queue or content store in Zookeeper, because I don't think that's what you should be using Zookeeper for. Zookeeper is about process coordination, I guess. <laughs> Another question? Uh, there will be access control. There will be. V uh, the question was about, sorry, I'm, I keep on forgetting. <laughs> yeah. uh, the question was what kind of ac uh, CMS features will we be supporting? Um, uh, there will be access control, uh, as we have that with DAISY, uh, so we will have some uh, access control mechanism uh, in uh, Lily as well. Uh, there will be uh, support uh, for, uh, in a future uh, edition, will be even workflow support. Uh, there will be a versioning support. Uh, with DAISY, the versioning is on a document level. With Lily, one of the big advancements, well, we see that as an advancement, but uh, you have to be in that area for a while, I guess, um, is that uh, you can say on a document schema level uh, what fields uh, need to be versioned uh, and what not, and then even define the scope of versioning. So there will be lots of versioning support in uh, Lily. Okay, other questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't mention it. This is a techie conference, and we're a techie company anyway, so uh, uh, we, we don't understand. But effectively, uh, a month ago, we were contacted by Gartner, and no, we didn't pay. We paid for the booklets. That's <laughs> that, that, that I confess. <laughs> uh, but uh, we were contacted by Gartner, which only proves that some people in Gartner are effectually keeping track of reality and realities. There's stuff going on with uh, scalable content management systems and OSQL. And they found out about this just by Google search. And we chatted with them for five minutes. We, have s uh, we exchanged three mails with them. Uh, and then we ended up being a cool CMS vendor because we're doing NoSQL. Yeah. Thank you, Gartner. <laughs> Thank you all for your interest.